Uh, obviously, uh, firstly, just to say thanks to the Institute of European Affairs, to uh, Rory and Peter and Alex and Oshin and all the team for the invitation here today. The Institute gave me my first professional start in life with an internship back in, a summer internship back in 1996, so I'm internally grateful. Thanks, of course, also to the ESB. Um, in fact, the ESB has one of, been one of uh, the European Investment Bank's best customers um, in Ireland uh, ever since we started financing projects in the country back in 1973. And in fact, if the statistic is correct here, it says here that we've signed almost 30 loans with the, uh, with the ESB across transmission, distribution, um, and power generation. And that, in fact, that would make the ESB not just our best customer in Ireland, I think one of our best customers anywhere in the world, in fact. And these aren't small loans, obviously. The average loan the EIB does is about 100 million. In fact, the most recent loan that we signed with ESB uh, was just, just a few months ago with the, for the Owen, Owenini Wind Farm in uh, Northwest Mayo to the 90 megawatt uh, power project there, a special purpose vehicle between ESB and Bordemona. Um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I should step back and just explain a little bit who the European Investment Bank is. We're the... EU bank, the Bank of the European Union, owned uh, uh, by the 28, still, still 28 uh, member states of the, of the European Union. And uh, together with the European Investment Fund, which is our subsidiary, which speci specializes in SME financing, uh, our group is essentially the financing arm of the European Union. Uh, so we're a taxpayer-owned and public bank. We're essentially your bank. And while we operate on a commercial basis, in other words, we don't receive budgetary contributions from the taxpayer. We've only, the taxpayer has only ever put money into the bank twice, once in 1958 when we were established, when six billion of gold, gold bullion was sent by the original six member states by train uh, to Brussels. And then we got a substance capital injection in 2012 at the height of the uh, financial crisis. Aside from those two ca capital injections, we've never taken a euro of taxpayers' money since then. We, are, we, we essentially finance ourselves in the global capital markets uh, and use that financing, obviously, to finance the projects that we, to, that we invest in. Um, and our financing terms, uh, so while it's not grant-based, we're, we're not providing free money, I mean, it's true our financing terms and indeed advisory supports can be very attractive, obviously, for project promoters. And our mission in life is to use the attractiveness of that financing as well as our advisory supports to strengthen and facilitate projects that support EU policy goals. Uh, we're based in, in Luxembourg, the bright, the bright lights of Luxembourg, uh, but we have set up an office here in Dublin in uh, 2016, three years ago, led by Cormac Murphy, who's amongst you. So for, for any of you who are interested in getting money out of the bank, Cormac, Cormac is the man to talk to. Um, our aim is not to compete with the private sector, and this is an important uh, message, but rather to complement what uh, the private sector does in, in uh, financing projects, uh, particularly to address what we call suboptimal investment situations that arise from market failures. Um, so investment promoters tend to like EIB support, not, not just because of our low interest rates, the interest rates of the EIB are, do tend to be below market, although actually in the current environment, uh, low interest rates are, are available in, from more than one place, so that's not necessarily the biggest attraction of EIB financing. More often than not, it's the long tenors that the EIB offers. So the fact that we can offer um, loan maturities of 15, 20, sometimes even 25 or 30 years, consistent with the life of, of the assets, this goes long beyond, beyond what most commercial banks can offer. That can be extremely attractive to investment promoters. What's also attractive to investment promoters is the fact that we put projects through a pretty tough due diligence. Now that can be difficult for project promoters, obviously having to answer an awful lot of questions, not just about their credit worthiness, but about the technical, economic, environmental, social standards of the project. The advantage of that though is that once we approve a project, it sends a very powerful signal to other potential financiers that it's received an EIB stamp of approval and it helps mobilize other sources of financing. We're, we're just over 60 years old, and our priorities and, and uh, products and instruments have evolved over time in line with the priorities of the European Union. I mean, all the way back from 
post-war reconstruction back in the late 50s and 60s, uh, infra infrastructure connectivity to help complete the single market through the 70s and 80s, um, a big focus on convergence and cohesion with the, with the major enlargement of the 1990s and, uh, and the 2000s, fighting the financial crisis over the last decade with a particular focus on, under the so-called Juncker Plan, the FC initiative, on improving access to financing for SMEs uh, and industry. These are all remain important goals for the bank. So all those things I mentioned, we, 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 we continue to do. But there's no doubt that um, the most urgent challenges facing the European Union right now um, are environmental. And obviously, in particular, the challenge to slow and adapt to uh, rising global temperatures. The IPCC reminds us in pretty stark terms that the world is nowhere close uh, to meeting the targets agreed under the Paris Accords and that on current trends we face potentially catastrophic risks. The EU is of course the world's pioneer uh, in the energy and climate transition and it is on course to deliver the 2020 20 targets uh, for next year. But as has been well articulated by others over the course of the day, uh, the, challenger, the challenges are only going to get much, much greater. The new 2030 EU climate and energy targets as agreed as part of the uh, Clean Energy for All Europeans package, the so-called winter package, aims for at least a 40% reduction in GHG, G, G, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And I do expect the new European Commission is likely to, to revisit that target and may, in fact, go even beyond it. It targets a 32% uh, penetration of renewable energy and final energy demand and a 32.5% uh, improvement in, in energy efficiency in energy savings compared, compared to the baseline forecast. Indeed, the European Commission has gone further and supported by so far 24 member states, including Ireland, proposes that the EU commit to a net zero emissions uh, by 2050. Now these targets require not incremental ge geometric increases in our eff efforts, but, in, but clearly an exponential one. Current greenhouse gas emissions will need to be cut by 50% 50, 50 over the next 10 years to meet the existing 2030 target. And then on the basis of a linear pathway towards 2050, another 50% over the course of the 2030s. The energy sector is going to have to lead the way, uh, at least under most of the, um, uh, the models, and energy-related investments are likely to have to at least double to over 400 billion a year, this is just in the European Union, uh, in the 2020s compared to this decade, and to over 550 billion a year in the 2030s, in order to basically take all greenhouse gas emissions out of the energy system by 2040. Perhaps a better way to grasp the scale of the investment and financing challenge is to understand that the net zero target by 2050 basically requires us to replace, if, if not uh, most, then certainly uh, probably about half of our physical capital stock that we have in our economies between now and then, over the next 30 years. When you think of our physical capital stock our housing, our buildings, our transport assets, our energy systems, our environmental and waste systems, our agricultural machinery, our industrial plant, but half of that will have to be replaced over, the, over that in order to meet that net zero target. So it's quite, quite an extraordinary and unprecedented challenge. So clearly to deliver on these ambitious goals, we need action on many levels. Let me name just four priorities for the, uh, for the European Investment Bank as the EU bank. Firstly, as the largest multilateral financial institution in the world, this isn't often well known, uh, where we don't do a lot of press releasing the EIB, but we are, in fact, about twice the size of the World Bank in terms of annual uh, financing volumes and uh, our balance sheet size. But we should use the power of that balance sheet, as well as our expertise, to strengthen and facilitate projects linked to climate mitigation and adaptation. Now, while we've already become, over the last decade, the largest multilateral provider of finance for projects supporting climate action and other environmental objectives in the world, we can and must do more. In its June, to, uh, June 2019 conclusions, the European Council, in fact, explicitly asked the EIB to further step up uh, our climate action activities. And in our own proposal to the European Parliament, uh, in July, the Commission President-elect uh, van der Leyen 
has proposed to turn the EIB into what she described as the EU Climate Bank. So what would being the EU Climate Bank mean for the European Investment Bank? Well, most obviously it'll mean a significant increase in the percentage uh, of, our over, of our annual 70 billion or so uh, investments for projects that address climate action and other environmental goals, up from the 25% the that, that, that you mentioned uh, from last year. And some countries have called for us to commit to a 50% target by, by 2025. This is something currently under consideration. How would we do that? How would we find the projects? There's no doubt, for example, we can significantly step up our advisory and financing support for energy efficiency projects in particular, and building energy efficiency retrof uh, retrofits. Buildings built today uh, or after will only represent about 10 to 25 percent of the building stock in the EU in 2050. So that means the overall energy performance of the existing stock, of the stock of buildings then, will largely be determined by the capacity to renovate and improve the energy performance of existing buildings. The availability of attractive financing conditions can help encourage people to make the investment decision. We can help by working in partnership with cities, municipalities, ESCOs or energy savings companies, housing companies, equity funds, corporates, as well as through uh, our partner banks other, and other financial intermediaries with local retail networks. Typically, we can do this by sharing the underlying risks contained within a partner's portfolio of energy efficiency loans. But in our experience, I should say cheaper debt alone does little to boost energy efficiency investments. Many investment opportunities, even those offering a relatively short payback period, are not taken. And that's why, together with the European Commission, the European Investment Bank has developed the European Local Energy Assistance Facility, the so-called ELENA facility, which helps promoters prepare and implement bankable energy efficiency projects and programs. And this is something we're rolling out here in Ireland uh, in partnership with the SEAI and other uh, partners in Ireland. And for example, just as a small example, a 1.5 million ELENA grant is helping Tipperary Energy Agency prepare energy audits and feasibility studies that will lead to hundreds of renewable energy renovations in private homes. And the grant signed in July of last year uh, is helping install insulation in homes and replace dirty solid fuel heating systems with modern heat pumps that use electricity. Clean power will also, of course, remain another priority for the EIB, and we can do more here as well. Renewable electricity capacity needs to effectively double across the European Union, including in Ireland, in the next decade. Even, as, the system, even as, we, as we move from a system of state-guaranteed supports to a, more to a more commercial footing. And while EIB's long loan tenors and project due diligence remain helpful to renewable energy promoters, as in the ONINI project, the RE market would also need increasing amounts of equity finance for development and power price risks. The EIB can help here too. Last year, for example, we provided an 84 million backing for NTR Renewable Energy Fund uh, to a Dublin-based 500 million fund that will provide equity and raise uh, equity finance for greenfield onshore wind and solar projects, as well as energy storage schemes across Ireland and the EU. But the deployment of existing energy technologies will not be enough, particularly for the 2050 targets. We will also, in cooperation with EU budget supports from the European Commission, finance large-scale demonstration and commercialization of new energy technologies in areas such as hydrogen, other power tech technologies, uh, battery storage uh, and manufacturing, demand flexibility, and carbon capture storage and utilization. This is important not just for the energy transition, but also for Europe's future technological capacity and industrial competitiveness. For example, we've recently approved a 350 million loan for a company called a startup called Northvolt, which is Europe's first battery gigafactory to supply a new generation of European electric cars. And we also have a couple of energy or technology demonstration projects under appraisal here in Ireland. And uh, I look forward to making announcements in that space soon. And given the challenges of de decarbonizing heat and transport, we expect to support increased electrification and sector coupling. 
particularly for European projects of common interest, like interconnectors between countries, such as the North-South interconnector and the proposed Celtic interconnector between Ireland and France. So if stepping up our investments in climate action projects is the first challenge, the second will be to work out uh, how the rest of our portfolio is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Being the EU Climate Bank is not just about what we do more of, but also about what we stop doing. Even as we continue our work with other uh, international financial institutions to agree a definition of what Paris alignment is going to mean for, for banks and other financial institutions, we have already proposed to our board of directors that the EIB become the first multilateral financing institution in the world to stop approving all unabated fossil fuel-based energy projects from 2020. And this will cover exploration, production, transportation and storage of non-renewable energy sources for the purposes of energy supply. I should emphasize that we recognize the role that gas in particular will play in the energy transition. While short-term fluctuations in renewable energy supply can be mitigated by batteries, hydro, and demand-side flexibility, and all of which we will support, it's also true that for the moment, gas remains the lowest cost, cost source of backup power to deal with seasonal imbalances between energy demand and the supply of renewables. And that's why we have proposed to retain the eligibility for EIB support of gas-fired power generation projects, where either the power generation from traditional methane is combined with the production of heat using best available technologies, so-called combined heat and power, particularly for district heating, or else where the traditional methane is blended and ultimately replaced by low carbon or renewable gases, such as hydrogen, synthetic methane, or biogas. And we will also continue to support carbon capture and storage. Now, we recognize that these technologies are at various stages of development and commercialization, but a significant increase in, this, in the numbers of these types of projects can be expected as a result of the support of the EU innovation and modernization funds, as well as the big increase in the price of CO2 under the reformed emissions trading system. While decarbonization of our economies need not lead to any reduction in living standards, a major imbalance between the costs and the costs and benefits between countries, regions, and social groups could undermine political support for the transition, as we have seen uh, in some countries uh, quite recently. And that is why the third priority for the European Investment Bank will be to support projects related to the so-called just transition. The EIB is already committed to offering extra help to those EU countries, particularly the newer member states, who are further behind in the shift from, uh, from fossil fuels to clean energy. But a just and fair transition must address not just the energy needs, uh, not just energy needs, but also the employment needs of populations in regions across the EU most affected by the phasing out of fossil fuels. In some coal regions, the bank is already supporting integrated regional plans across sectors, but we must do more. Uh, and then we have committed to bringing our advisory services and financing power to support the European Commission's recently proposed Just Transition Initiative. I think the possibilities are illustrated, in fact, by the, the Owenini project that I mentioned, where a site once used for peat harvesting by Bordnamona uh, to provide indigenous fuel for ESB peat-fired, uh, the, the, the peat-fired power uh, station in Belacoric now provides sustainable jobs and clean, clean electricity to 50,000 homes. The fourth and final priority for the EIB is, as a public bank with deep experience in sustainable finance, to help mobilize others, particularly the private, private investors, into green and low-carbon investments. With this aim in mind, we're working with the European Commission uh, in the Technical Advisory Group on Sustainable Finance to agree a common international taxonomy on what economic activities are indeed sustainable. As the first ever issuer of green bonds back in 2007, and the largest issuer since then, the EIB has become increasingly concerned by the threat to green finance from the proliferation of differing definitions of economic sustainability, the multiple competing labels, as well as differing disclosure, reporting, and auditing requirements. A draft EU taxonomy for climate mitigation and adaptation was published by the European Commission in June, and I'm glad to report to this conference 
that power transmission and distribution was, after some debate and discussion, included in the definition. The EU taxonomy will act as a compass for investors and aims to facilitate a significant behavioural change in the decisions of asset managers and other financial intermediaries. It will provide a clear legal framework, initially within Europe, but perhaps eventually across the world, that sustains growing retail and institutional investor interest in green finance, including in green bonds, green mortgages, and green investment funds. It will also generate the transparency that can help investors to manage the financial risks stemming from climate change, environmental degradation, and from social issues. A final observation in conclusion. There's a lot that banks and other financial intermediaries like the EIB can do uh, to help finance the decarbonisation challenge. I mean, we need to change our own policies, as I have mentioned, our products, our technical expertise, look at our risk models and our marketing efforts. But we are, at the end of the day, dependent on project promoters presenting investable projects. As with water flowing downhill, money will eventually find its way to them. But good policies are essential in this regard. Adequate carbon pricing, effective regulation, and good regional and urban planning. Let me give you two examples that have been essential for the EIB. I estimate that the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive back in 2013 basically quadrupled the amount of energy efficiency financing that the bank was able to do. By, by imposing a new standard, the, NED, the NZEB standard, by a certain deadline, and bringing forward a massive increase in the number of energy efficiency projects. That was an excellent example. We increased our energy efficiency financing from 1 billion a year in 2013 to about 4 billion a year last year because of that directive. Another example is the, uh, is the emissions trading system. I mean, the recent increase in the price of carbon uh, from about 8 euro a ton two years ago to about 30 euro a ton now, we're already seeing is leading to a resurgence in the number of renewable energy projects that we're being asked to finance across Europe. We went through a serious dip in 2015 and 2016 in terms of uh, demand for our, for our financing in the renewable energy area. But that pricing system, the reformed pricing system, which is effectively, in the minds of a lot of investors, put a floor under the price of carbon, has led to a renewed interest again. So policy is absolutely crucial. This intersection, an understanding of the relationship between finance and policy, is something we want to spend a lot more time on in the coming years. And now that governments have prepared these draft national energy and climate plans, we, what we have now proposed to our member states, to the 28 member states, that every year in every member state, we will host what we call a national energy finance workshop to look at that intersection between finance and policy, to see what needs to be tweaked in terms of policy, what we need to change in terms of our instruments, so that the actual plans that the governments have set out can be implemented in practice. Thank you very much for your attention.